Okay. Okay. Um, several administrative things. I did receive exercise one from about 80% um, of you, but some people did not deliver and their, their names are on the list. So if you were not able to deliver the exercise because you were delivering too late, you need to let me know so you can send me an email with the exercise if you still want to take the exam because the required exercises have to be delivered and approved before you can take the exam. And I will let you know before the exam if they're approved or if they would need to be redone. <coughs> They were supposed to deliver after I Yeah, yeah. Did you do that? Yeah. Okay. So then I should have you on the list. Yeah, Joachim. Joachim. Uh, are you Bendel? Uh, okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, there's two Joachims. Yep, I got yours and I didn't get Bendel's. So I need to, if, if you know of anyone that's not here and, and didn't get to deliver, they should contact me. Okay. <coughs> hmm. It's because there's like a window and it closes. I don't know how to reopen it. So then you have to send me email. So <coughs> uh, <coughs> the other thing is um, the next exercise, exercise two. Let's see if it goes. That's not that one. Um, good exercise. Okay, um, this one involves a five to ten minute uh, presentation and it's going to take place next week. So you need to already be looking at this and I have put the names in. I put this in actually last week so you should have been able to see it since last Monday. And um, <coughs> so these are, if you are listed with somebody, then you're working with somebody, it's because I thought the issue was a little bit more difficult than some of the other ones. So yeah, um, but if the person here, you're not in <coughs> touch with them and you're working with them, you need to send them an email or something. Um, somebody from the topic needs to present something next week. And we're going to also have a guest lecture here. So we will use the first part of the lecture, I believe the first part, for, for doing this. And then the second part of the lecture will be a guest lecture uh, on a topic that he hasn't confirmed yet. So we'll see next week. Um, <coughs> OK, so that's, that's available on the course page, and you can find it under mandatory assignments. <coughs> okay, today we're going to uh, talk about chapter 12. And briefly, uh, I just want to say chapter 13 is about education. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that chapter. It's not really re that relevant for us because it was written something like 10 years ago and it relates to US um, um, higher education program. So <coughs> we're just going to skip over chapter 13. And if we have time, I will say some words about chapter 14. And if we don't have time, then I will do it in the next lecture after the uh, guest lecture. Uh, so basically, we'll cover chapter 12 today. And I thought because uh, there's this meeting at 11.15, you know about and <coughs> that we would just do the first hour and then we would not do the second hour so that if you want to attend that meeting you're welcome to attend that meeting and so um, <coughs> I think we can uh, get by with one hour of lecture today so <coughs> Finally, lectures. Here we go. 
Okay. <clears throat> I uh, had this lecture set up last week because we did chapter 10 and 11, but I changed it a bit so chapter 12 has some different uh, slides included. So if you've printed it or something, you might look at it again uh, because chapter 12 is a, a little bit different. Okay. Uh, chapter 12 is about design and documentation. And this is where we go from uh, the research part of the design to actually uh, producing the deliverables, the, what is going to be the information architecture for the product, which is, if we say it's a website, uh, then that's the product. And it's the process that leads to this uh, website. But it comes through as the um, general design guidelines for the website. Uh, so some of the things that they recommend, first of all, is that you have <coughs> um, multiple views. And you use a lot of different types of visualization tools to do this. And that um, you develop different uh, views for different audiences. So you might have some um, different subsites within your site that are designed for different audiences and different needs. So this might require different um, views for the different subsites. Uh, two of the main tools that they recommend and that were talked about also in the last chapter are blueprints and wireframes. Uh, the blueprints show the relationship between the pages and the content components. So it shows, uh, like if you have different pages, what they are for, and the links between, the logical links between the components. And it can be used to uh, portray the uh, intent of the sites, the organization, the navigation, and the labeling systems. And there's different types of blueprints. Some of these are high-level architecture blueprints, and others are um, task-oriented uh, blueprints. These can also be high-level. And some are more uh, detailed in, in uh, their specifications. So this is an example on page, uh, figure 12.1 of a high-level blueprint. And you can see that there's a main page and that um, they have different types of uh, groupings of um, pages. So they have um, value headed guides is one grouping, sub -direct subsite directory is another grouping, and then subsites. And then in the subsite directory, they have it further broken down into comprehensible searching and browsing and subsite records. So this is to um, give you an idea of what each of these. Uh, subsections are four. Another example of a high level blueprint is um, <coughs> figure 12.4, and this shows um, how, figure, how filtering might work for an e greeting uh, card website. So you see that at any level, the user can view cards at that level, go to the level if one exists go to lower level if one exists, filter available tones, filter available formats. And so then there's the level is uh, the reason to send the card, more specific reason or content category, and recipient or content category. And then you can uh, choose different types of formats and different types of messages, like the, the content, the tone of the message. And this is a, a good <coughs> intended to be a very high level uh, blueprint that demonstrates how you might filter the work on the on the website. A different kind of uh, blueprint would be a task oriented blueprint and this is centered on a user centered view of the card sending process at the greeting card site. So here you have this is the steps or the process that the user goes through when they uh, encounter the site because they're making use of the site to create a card. So they have a thumbnail page and views and details 
and then, then they have the blank card and then they have the view of the card and the customized card and then um, how to customize the card and how to send it and then a confirmation mail and um, this is um, uh, sent to anyone so you can like send to additional different ways of spreading the card and how the recipient sees it and the reply um, uh, pick a reply category so there's a different there's a process from the point of view of the person who's creating the card and they have different kinds of color coding so important but outside scope and then key components of the send process and then the integrated components okay so if we go just again to here the blueprints purpose is to show the relationship between the pages and the other components content components so it shows a relationship between uh, the different content objects or components and then the wireframe design uh, shows how the page would kind of look and it's at different degrees of fidelity fidelity is a concept about how clear it is like how much resolution something has in a visual context but in this it's more like how much detail does the wireframe have so <coughs> You can uh, group component types from uh, very simple fidelity to very high fidelity. And then um, they suggest that you, uh, when you're developing the design of the, the wireframes, you should look at the issues like consistency. Um, so if you have like the same uh, elements they should be consistent to different pages on the website and um, reuse is uh, when you have um, certain types of elements uh, they should be uh, available throughout the website or this may be you may be able to create this using different types of visualization tools so you could create a wireframe for one a top level page and then you could create a wireframe for a lower level page and they could use some of the same tools that have been put into the wireframe like maybe a, a like a search um, uh, <coughs> window or uh, a menu bar or something like that and then callouts or notes on the functionality of the page it means like it's, there's an additional explanation that means what each of these areas mean and then uh, they suggest professional meaning that uh, you should label the pages with uh, numbers and titles so that you have some sort of neatness and organization that comes through as professional and then you follow the uh, procedures when <coughs> you work in teams so if you have different teams working on different aspects of the elements you should uh, all follow the same types of procedures and then um, so <coughs> these guidelines are listed on page 313 and the example of the high fidelity wireframe is on this is a picture on page 285 that was actually from chapter 10 I'm in chapter 11, but there's also some in chapter 12. Um, let me just look at this for a second. Mm. Okay, so this is another example of a wireframe that is um, part of the uh, main page of the greeting card site and it's um, it, they suggest that you can create wireframes for some pages but you don't necessarily have to create it for all pages and uh, that the goal is not to create wireframe for every page but only for the ones that 
or complicated, unique, or set patterns for other pages. So for example, it might be a template for different types of pages on your website. So if it's some, like many of the pages on your website look the same way. If it's a product page, for perhaps you might have uh, information about a product and then you have some more details in, and it has a certain specific layout that's true for all of the product pages, then you would make a template for this type of page. So this has um, a header and navigation for the site's uh, wide functions. So these are kind of um, the call out or the explanation of the different uh, categories. Tabs representing major categories of services, primary card classification schemes, uh, promote searching using wizards on the home, position the um, the user's not satisfied by the channel. So there's different explanations about what these mean. And they said that just the fact that this is bigger than this indicates that there's a greater importance to um, for this information than, than for this information. So that was... Um, um, you get some of the aesthetics in, involved in the design of the web page by identifying <coughs> the size of different elements in the web page and the position in the web page. Um, it says that it talks about collaboration. It says make it uh, clear that you expect collaboration with graphic designers to improve the aesthetic nature of the overall site or with the interaction designers to improve the functionality of the web page widgets. So there may be different people that are involved in improving the aesthetic look of the page and those who are involved in improving the functionality of the page. Um, So this is, uh, wireframes can represent any types of content and you have, uh, uh, this is um, uh, messages and instructions and you can see that they're, they're the same, they look the same but there are different uh, stages to the wireframe. So you have, this shows categories that are available at this point. So there may be different um, elements that are identified in the wireframe. And then, as I said, there can be different types of fidelity. So some of them may be very simple and they have um, just to identify the basic focus of the, web, of the website and the layout of the content in the visual elements. Uh, but then there may be some that are of medium fidelity and this can introduce aspects of content, layout, navigation uh, that might be important to the discussion of what goes into the web page. And the discussion is what takes place between the graphic designers and the programmers. So you have uh, the graphic designers or the people that care about the aesthetics and the people that care about the functionality talking to each other and they decide what aspects of content and layout and navigation should be included in the website, in the web, in the wireframe. And then you might have high fidelity uh, wireframes like this one is an example of a high fidelity wireframe. And that uh, it comes to a close approximation of what the page will actually look like. So this is supposedly, uh, it goes m into more detail about the content and the layout and the navigation and it also shows more specifically what it would look like. So here you have card thumbnails and then you have title and, and more information under each one, more for mom, more for daughter, that's very specific. And it might be um, uh, something, well, they say this is medium frame, but I think that's also ex extremely ex specific says a more d uh, detailed explanation and more unique content.
Okay, um, there is also a picture of a low fidelity wireframe on page 310 and this kind of looks like, the low fidelity one kind of looks like the templates that are provided on the website that I showed you last week and I'll show you that again um, in a bit. Um, the other topics that are related to this process is uh, content mapping. And um, oh, I just wanted to go back a second. Uh, when we're talking about wireframes, this had to do with uh, guidelines for wireframes. And this is on page 313. And they also suggest that these are kind of best practices for wireframes. So when we talk about how you create these wireframes, uh, you should use these as types of uh, rules of thumb or guidelines for how, this, how you would create the wireframes. So just going back to, we went through several examples of what wireframes look like. Uh, they can be at different levels of detail and that they, they suggest that that's some of the good practice guidelines. Uh, the other issue is about uh, the design stage is content mapping. So after you have designed what the basic look of the page is going to be, where different content elements should be located, uh, you need to do some uh, mapping of what the, actually the content is going to go into the web page. And this means that you need to see what kind of information you're working with and break that information up into chunks. So they suggest uh, several, they give several examples like on page uh, 3, uh, 15 and 16 they have some figures. And uh, the questions that are asked on page uh, 3, 14 are uh, should the content be divided into smaller chunks that users might want to use to access separately? What is the smallest chunk you need? What will this content uh, uh, will this content be repurposed for multiple documents? So will it be used in different places on the site? So do different pages or different uh, documents in the site need to make use of the same information? And this will influence about, uh, this will influence how big you group information. So the groups of information are called chunks and they may be presented in different ways. So they may be presented for uh, a, a website or they may be presented in a condensed form for a, a PDA or they may be used um, and they, sh they should have a unique code so that you can identify with the chunks of information. A uh, picture of this is on uh, page 315 and they show different types of chunks. So they have, for example, the chunks for printing the brochure. Um, they have on P36-1 with papers and this was for some uh, website that listed papers and panels and a conference with information about who participates in the conference. And they have one section on the website that's dedicated for a description of the papers. And that kind of template would be repeated uh, many times. So if they wanted to populate the web page uh, automatically, they would use this uh, chunk of information, maybe the abstract of the paper, to populate that part of the website. So they the uh, chunking or the grouping of the information for in order for populating the website was important. And on uh, page um, 316, they have figure 1217. This is a content mapping table matches content chunks and their destinations. So if you have some places on the page where they're supposed to go, uh, this would map the type of information to the place on the web page and where it should go. And then on page 317 is a picture, this is in your book, uh, of um, the web page that is produced by the content mapping process. 
So hopefully the page gets populated uh, with the information and then you can use this over and over again to, to populate it with other information. So, uh, so chunking or content mapping could imp is important for identifying where information should go when it's going to be reused in different parts of the website. And then the content model is uh, the relationship between the chunks of information and the architecture. And uh, it shows, it helps with contextual navigation. So it helps you to show what you're interested in. Um, <coughs> so it helps people also to cope with uh, scale so that they can uh, <coughs> auto populate the links uh, better. <coughs> And uh, we experience the content models on the web on the web a lot of times. They could be in like the form of a recipe as an example of content model. It has the ingredients at the top and the instructions <coughs> below that. <coughs> and uh, an example of a clothing website is also an example of a content model. It shows uh, maybe the name of the article and it's the price and the description of the article and what people should do, like the steps for purchasing. And then uh, the content models depend on consistent steps of the objects and the logical connections between them. So uh, there needs to be uh, follow this logical model uh, for all occasions of use. And it should also help to identify um, the points of entry of the site and you need to be able to identify uh, what type of metadata is needed to connect the chunks of information together. So the content mapping is actual identifying where things should uh, be, the type of information that should be put into certain locations on the page. And then the content model is the relationship between the chunks. So it helps you identify where you are, where do you want to go uh, on the site. An example of this is um, the content modeling is uh, you have content objects that might be the basis of the content model for an ob album information. So some content uh, objects would be, for example, album pages, artists, biographies, uh, uh, album descriptions, and album reviews. These are the objects of the content model. And then the uh, example of creating the content model would be, you could use a card sorting exercise like we did last time. Uh, basically, you would put different types of content objects on the cards and then ask the, the subjects to uh, list how these objects would be connected. So they would have to draw lines between these. So if they're on the album page, they might be searching for the artist's biography or the album description. So there needs to be some sort of a link between these different objects and how, if I'm in one place, how would, where would I want to go from there? How would I search for something else? And then the gap analysis uh, would be after that to s identify, like maybe there's different uh, other types of information that we need that should be included in this uh, content uh, model, and then you would also draw the, how they are linked to the to the other objects. So the output of the process would be something like this. Uh, you would have an, uh, a content model that shows navigation and missing content objects. Uh, so we have the objects, the content objects, and the relationships between these objects. So if I'm on the album page, I might want to go to album reviews. <coughs> if I'm on the discography page, I might want to go to the album page or vice versa. And uh, this was not even suggested originally in the object uh, card set, the object model card set. So it was as identified in a gap analysis as a missing object content. So this is the idea of creating the mapping process. Um, so if we have 
The content mapping would be the kind of information that should go in certain places. And then the content model would be the relationship between this information. Okay. Um, the other thing, items that they talk about in the chapter are web-based prototypes. And these are uh, digital renditions of the website. Maybe it actually is a subset or part of the website and how it actually would look. So sort of like a test section or test uh, version of the website. And uh, administration, they said that the administration can discuss things like how small can the chunks be or is more navigation needed? Uh, can we shorten labels? So this is more down to details. And uh, they suggested you can create a style guide. And the style guide will describe how the site is organized, why it is organized that way, and who is it organized for. And the style guides can contain things like standards, guidelines, and maintenance procedures. And the reason that you'd want to have this is that so the next group that comes in and makes changes to the design of the website can or makes additions even, not even changing the whole structure, can refer to this uh, style guide and then make additions that are aligning with the, uh, the original decisions of the website. And as I pointed out before, there's tools here. And you can look at, there's different ways of, uh, they t talk about the card sorting. You can look at an article about how that's done and brainstorming. These are ways of uh, cre creating these uh, models and designs and uh, communicating together. Uh, there's also, let's see, down a little bit further, different types of visual tools and uh, templates that can be used. Like sometimes they talk about templates for drawing these uh, visualizations. And um, stencils. And then there's also uh, examples of wireframes. So if we look at a wireframe, for example, uh, this is an example of a wireframe. And it's a, it would be a very low fidelity one. It's a, very similar to the one that's uh, pictured in the book. I think it was on page 312 or something like that. Page 10. Yeah, 310. So this is like very similar to the one on, on uh, page 310 as an example of a low fidelity wireframe. So this can be used as a tool for uh, developing wireframe for your site. And that's just one. There's many different types that you, you can uh, look at here. Uh, they, there's even some uh, discussion about process maps. And so it's like just generally some useful tools uh, at this site. Okay. Okay, um, so those are the main uh, points of the chapter. And um, even though I didn't put in all of the figures, you have them in your book and you can uh, look at them as examples of different types of wireframes. And um, just in the last 10 minutes, I wanted to talk about, uh, I'll talk about chapter 14 now. And it's just very brief. Um, chapter 14 is about ethics and uh, you might think that the information architects don't have ethical issues but uh, the authors point out that there's ethics in, in basically every field and you're also involved in the access to information. That's one of the jobs of the information architect is access to information. So I'll just write a couple of his points up here the chapter on ethics, because I didn't make a slide set for that. And I think I can put on the light. Let's 
So chapter 14 is on ethics. And he points out that there's different issues for informational architecture, but in particular he talks about labels and uh, also categorization. And he uses the example of um, grid uh, versus aids. And he says that um, let me just see. It's on page other chapter. Oh, yeah, dear. I forget what the acronyms mean, so I have to look them up. Yeah, he says that the grid acronym means um, gay-related immune disorder, whereas the AIDS acronym says acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And he says that different types of labels uh, create uh, different impressions of the disease and they have like biases on the disease. He also uses another example about um, uh, fatigue syndrome. So somebody also another one, so fatigue. So if you have um, fatigue syndrome, maybe you're, somebody doesn't want to hire you because you have this as a label. So labels can be important in terms of um, how, uh, in terms of biases. So he recommends that um, avoid uh, the use of where you can inject undesirable biases. So try to select labels. If you're designing a site where you avoid uh, undesirable biases, interjecting undesirable biases. Another thing he talks about is granularity. And he gave an example of like the nursing uh, work schedule or something to that effect. Uh, chunking of information. How, what is the size of the information? He says if you make it too big, you might overgeneralize. And if you make it too small, it may be too segmented. So to get the right representation, you have to identify uh, what is the right, the relevant size of the information. Another issue that's um, probably one of the most important is access to information that This is probably one of the things the information architect is most in control of. And that's because uh, you have a responsibility to allow access to websites, for example, for uh, both uh, physically and intellectual disabled. Uh, people. So uh, there's different types of web standards. That should be considered when designing websites. 
so that uh, people with physical or intellectual disability can access that information. Another point they make is persistence. And I will just summarize this as uh, what, um, what goes on the web stays on the web. That's, uh, you can't get rid of it. So if you create a category that may show prejudice or bias or something, uh, even if you decide to change your design, uh, there is going to be some effect that that is forever accessible. So you have to think about your decisions and part of the ethics process is to uh, think ahead about what your actions are going to do and then be responsible for those actions after you make your decisions. So, um, but you can also think about what is maybe some other ethical issues involved in information architectures. Information architecture. And um, maybe there's some areas here that aren't covered and you can think about those as well. Okay, so now we have, um, we're finished with chapter 14. That was a very brief chapter. And next week you have your second exercise that you will also deliver. There's a written component that you deliver on Fronter. And then there's the oral component that you present in class. And then we will have a guest lecture. So we're done for today. Thanks. Thank you.